Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Mark. How's it going? I did not expect the bear. That's awesome. <laughs> You're the only person who knows what I really look like now. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, can you boost your volume a little bit? Oh, really? My gain's not that high? Hang on one second. Uh, let's try a second. How about now? Better, uh, better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. So how's it going? Good. I just got off a Zoom call. If you think I'm too quiet, I can um, uh, I can reset it. So I think, so welcome to Mindshock. You, Mark Sargent, are actually the first official flat earther that I've talked to. Really? Because yeah, I've, so, I've, I've watched a lot of stuff, and you know what? You're right. I don't think I've seen you talk to anybody. So I've talked to, I've had a number of people on. I had a, a Mensa member, a former Mensa member on, and he's not a flat earther per se, hmm. but he didn't, he, he's, he was smart enough to, kind of like me, he didn't really take a position. He actually wasn't even that shocked if it would turn out to be true. He he wasn't a flat earther, but I don't know if you heard that one, that episode. I did I did not hear that one. That sounds intriguing. Yeah, it, it's it's a really old one and he wasn't too familiar with flat earth theory. So most of what I was saying was new to him. Hmm. And if you want to hear an interview, um Nate I think Nathan Oakley actually went over it on his podcast. Oh, okay. He, yeah, he did take the opportunity to trash me a little bit in that one. <laughs> but Nathan Oakley trashes everybody. Yeah. That's what he does. That's well, he in does. all fairness, in all fairness, I kind of trashed him too in the logical analysis he did with, with David Whitehead, which was actually really disappointing if you're familiar with Whitehead. Probably not by name, but go ahead. He did the Unslaved podcast years ago really sharp guy yeah. all about conspiracies as well as the occult so i was really surprised at how hard a anti-flat earth stance he took given he is so anti-establishment i was really shocked especially because of his occult like all of his occult spiritual knowledge yeah where because all the ancients obviously had flat earth cosmology so Obviously, I wasn't expecting him to believe in flat Earth, but I wasn't expecting him to behave like you know your standard triggered, you know, authority worshiping cultist, as I call them. <laughs> they just worship authorities. Right. So it was a little shocking. But uh, Nathan Oakley actually, what I went over in that podcast was how Oakley's really good at the advanced fallacies, but yeah. he actually is he commits a lot of really basic ones. So. It was it was interesting. Oh, well, yeah, I will I will check it out. Send send me a link when, if you if you have one after the show. Yeah, I'll understand. email. Yeah, I'll email you. But I, the I'd Mensa member to. was curious because this guy, one of the only guys I've ever talked to with basically no ego, no hubris, and when we were going over just how it would affect the world and how most so called credentialed individuals and scientists, etc., they can't. They're too mentally weak to even consider the possibility. His yeah. response to that was, it could be a new beginning, which I thought was really interesting. because, And this was the first time he had ever had a real flat earth conversation. But I'll send you the link. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, please do. But please do. I had a few other people on that also didn't necessarily go take an anti-flat earth stance, but they didn't... Uh, they weren't flat earthers like you. You're a flat earther, correct? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so you're a hundred percent. You're a hundred percent certain in the model. Yep, I'm all in. Absolutely. Okay. So just real quick, is there anything you don't want me to touch upon in the interview? No, no. Every everything. It's anything goes. Fair game. I I I never. In fact, when people want to talk to me, I say and they say, "Oh, can we send you some advanced questions?" I go, "Don't even bother. Uh, <laughs> I'd I'd rather get them cold." Yeah, I just I just want to make sure that there's nothing you're uncomfortable with discussing on oh, any. Oh no, topic. no, no. What that all of a sudden develop a facial tick and and uh, <laughs> start. It's like, oh my god, the helicopters, can't you hear them? 
No. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask you the first question that I've been dying to ask you yeah. ever since you showed up in the Mind Shock chat all that time ago. It's yeah. a really important question. Everybody's mm-hmm. going to be shocked at this question. Mm-hmm. As far as nicknames, does anybody call you Marky Mark? They do. They do. And really? it's funny. It's funny. Okay. First off, thank you. You're the first person to actually ask me that formally. Uh, there, There is a chat group in chat or in Skype called Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch created <laughs> by some of the what, what can now be considered the early circles of, uh, of Flat Earth. Um, Karen B would would be in there. Zulu One, uh, Carly Carly Sunshine, and others. And yeah, they created that. I am older than that, so it doesn't bother me. I mean, yes, I knew of Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. You know, one of the early boy bands. Uh, and I was not a huge boy band fan, but I don't loathe them to the point where you know all of a sudden I get triggered and just you know want to start a bar fight because of it. <laughs> but uh, no, I've never. Yes, people people have called me. Ev- Going, growing up, of course, you know, once the band came out, you know, I hear that every once in a while, but it's too easy. Um, most people will make fun of my, my last name more than uh, my first name because my last name's Sergeant. Do and they so call I you get, Sarge? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> constantly. Absolutely freaking constantly. And I was actually glad that I did not go military um, because my father during the Vietnam War um, uh, was a first sergeant in the um, in the Air Force. Because you, you want to make sure it stay away as far as possible. So Air Force Reserve over here in California. And so wait, when wait, he had wait. to answer. So, so he was Sergeant Sergeant. Yep. And I don't think he thought that far ahead. Because when you answer the phone like that. Because he had a desk job. You had to answer it that way. Yeah. For Sergeant Sergeant. And he got in trouble so often. Because they didn't understand. You know. It's yeah. like no no. It's spelled different. It's oh, phonetic. They thought he was jo- They thought he was joking. Yeah. They thought, they thought yeah. he was. He was screwing with them. And so he got. You know. They say. You have to explain it. All the time. It's like no. Wow. My last name is Sergeant. And spell it out. It's like. Somebody should have gone to him. And said dude. You, you. Probably not a good idea. To do the military. So. I was saving this question. For a little later. But we might as well get into it now. Yep. Because. I don't just want to ask you if, if what you think of people calling you and others a shill. Yeah. Because one of my questions was actually going to be, if you don't mind answering, the profession of your parents. And I actually didn't know that your father was a military man, but that's going to give them more ammunition. Because No, no, no. Only only during Vietnam. Uh, his official position, what's kind of weird, he was a corporate recruiter in the 70s, and then he was a... Um, uh, a hatchet man, corporate hatchet man in the eighties, uh, which meant he fired people. He, he was the guy you like, you did not, it was, I felt bad for him because you didn't want to go to lunch with him. You know, if he invited you out yeah. to lunch, you, you didn't want to go, but he was a corporate recruiter in the seventies. Um, uh, he was also a mediator. He had a, a number of different jobs. He'd mediate, he'd mediate disputes between labor and management, like unions and management and stuff like that. But no, in, in Viet, the military thing was strictly Vietnam which okay. was if you knew the rules back then which was you know there was a draft and yeah. so if you were going to go in you wanted to you wanted to enlist and then make position yourself away from the the front lines if possible you did not want to wait until the draft because you were going infantry and it's like he was like he had heard from his friends like oh no no air force reserve stationed somewhere in the states you're going to be fine so, so to your knowledge no cia involvement of any kind no no, no, neither of my parents were, were but my, my mother was a career teacher. Um, okay. my, my grandfather's, neither of them, my grand, my grandfather on my mother's side was a career accountant. Um, now, and I said, actually, one of my speeches I did, uh, at Flattoberfest a couple of years ago, I, I told people, I go, I go, look, there was something really weird that, you know, yes, both of my, my grandparents were, Ma- my grandfathers were Masons, but neither was a 33rd. In fact, one was a, um, a Templar and the other was the Prairie of Sion, which meant they were on other sides of the fence. And, um, but they would, what was odd was they knew each other. In fact, I read, a, we didn't know until years later, until one of them had already died, that they were pen pals before they were even married, which was so odd, you know, that, um, that I've, I've still got the letter where they, they knew each other and yet neither side of the family knew this until until that letter came out 
which was you'd think it'd come up like during the wedding rehearsal dinner, right? If you these guys were pen pals and they lived within 20 minutes of, of each other in Seattle during during the World War era, why would they um why would they allow their firstborn kids to get married? Right? It's without telling them. It's like, oh yeah, by the way, was it an arranged marriage? No, because you would have told the kids. Oh, you would have thought. But anyway, it was strange. Sorry, keep going with your with your thing. Yeah, now. that was actually nope. a very interesting answer because you actually shocked my mind a little bit. So you're openly admitting both of your grandfathers are Masons. Yeah, were. So, they're, they're both deceased now, but yes. Yeah, so that's interesting because I don't know how all of the anti-flat earthers or the people within the flat earth community could just call everybody shells because there's a lot of that. Right. There's a lot of that. Yeah. Would you, if you were a shell, would you openly admit that? I don't know. I've no, never heard no, anybody I, else do. No, and and let me let me clarify something. The the shill thing again for anyone listening that don't even know what shill is. Most people don't. Even, they're too lazy to even look it up. Um, the root of that is shillaber, which is um, uh, a carney's. You know what a carney is? Uh, a carnival guy, a Leeds assistant, and it goes. It's 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 a it's a grift as old as time, which is most people know it even outside of the carnival, which would be like uh, three card monte. If you've ever seen that being played on the street. You know, yeah. find the queen or find the yeah, ball. Yeah. The shill is the guy that's silently working in the crowd to get the crowd excited about playing. The guy would be like, oh, yeah, I won 20 bucks off this guy. I found the queen just like that. That's what a shill does. A shill is the secret guy in the in the audience that get that's working with the guy on stage. And uh, but the reason why I was called a shill for it wasn't wasn't because I was doing anything shilly, even though I think that's really a word. Um, it was it was mostly because of one guy. And you know who it is. I mean, you know, the name, which is Eric Dubay, which was back in the day. And in fact, Matt Boylan collaborated with him. I still got the emails from from Matt, where when we were the three of us were doing this stuff back in um, early 2015, Matt reached out to me and said, look, Eric and I are going to go a certain way. You need to go with us, or you know, you're either with us or you're against us, and that's when those two actually had a very brief alliance, and it never, never let up. Eric does never likes sharing the 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 stage with anybody, and everybody else is, you know, again, if you're either with him entirely or you're against him, and he, I mean, I wasn't the first. I mean, there, I I could send you a link after the show. He still has his enemies list on the uh, the <laughs> Ifers page which is the um, International Flat Earth Research Society, which is I'm I'm number one with a bullet. Why? I, I'm one of the it's nicest funny. guys. Yeah. So, yeah. It's Eric DeBay. So, so no, ne never been a, yeah, I've never worked for a government agency unless I'm what, like a monarch thing. But then, boom, then what do you do? Well, I think, I think one of the reasons this was immediately jumped to my mind when people are calling you a show, because yeah. you seem a little too good at media. <laughs> there you go. And, and, and that was mostly because of all the tech support, the phone work. I did. I did thousands and thousands of hours of text phone support way before chat rooms were even a thing um, back in the 90s and, and early 2000s. Um, I was doing high level tech support for um, uh, time and attendance software companies. And so I was taking and I was good at it So on top of it. I mean, it helps when when you're somewhat articulate. So. I was doing the high stress calls, you know, where people are crying on the other of the phone and you got lawyers on the other of the phone and hell, there was even a, a like a hitman on the other end of the phone. He was like, I, I want to fly out there and take care of things. It's like, dude, what are you going to do? What? Really? You're going to fly to the software company and start <laughs> whacking people. Um, and you do that enough and eventually you get comfortable with just about every type of, of person you can, you know, you, well, you can, also you, yeah. I have another theory too because you're from I don't know how to pronounce it Wimbley Island. <laughs> no, it's um it's Whidbey. Uh, uh, it's northwest northwest northwest. It, in fact, you can see Canada right up the the road from here. Um, it's W H I D B E Y uh, named is after. There, a... Is there a Whidbey or is there only a Whidley? Whid Whidbey. Whid Whidbey. Whidbey. So think of Whidbey only. Spell it Whidbey. different. W H I D B E Y. And Whidbey. there's no there's no other island next to it with a similar name. Nope. I'm just making sure because I actually I heard another person from that island, not on a flat earth podcast. It was some random podcast. Yeah. And it seems like there's a lot of really nice people on this island. Sure. Because 
this individual was like was super nice like beyond southern comfort type nice uh southern hospitality type nice and i'm like maybe that has something to do with it and <laughs> me constantly and by the way if i was a if i was a shill i would yeah i mean to your point i have gotten to do a lot i've had opportunities that other people haven't to be sure but at the same time my social media presence has been restricted on levels that are beyond coincidence way way beyond coincidence to where i mean the whole community to be sure um and in some ways that's actually good because people have asked me also they said oh do you think anybody if not you is there anybody in the community that is a shill and i go no and you want to know how i know this because there's been no breakouts meaning our biggest and i said this in the, the speech i did back in vegas which was our biggest subscriber person would be odd right? ODD reality. And he's sitting at what, 300K, right? The, if anyone all of a sudden jumped out in front and whether they bought them or they were assigned them, you know, got a million subs, everyone would just start, you know, squinting at them. They're like, okay, who the hell are you? Um, every, everything's been very, very organic. Um, yes, I've, I've gotten, but I've like, my channel isn't the biggest by any stretch. Not, not even close. Uh, I haven't gotten to do all sorts of things, but I've also gotten to do things that other people haven't. So I, I get it. People. So, well, to me, you, the only thing that was a little tiny bit suspicious to me was your last name. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, really, like, that's it. Pretty much, because you said you played video games, so yeah. that kind of, and you were really into conspiracies, and you did tech support. So that, to me, and now that you actually revealed that your grandfathers were Masons. That's yeah. unless you're playing 4D chess here to try yeah. to appear not to be a chess. Yeah. But are you aware? So I did do a deep dive into Eric Dubay. Are you aware yeah. that he's from the Langley, Virginia area, and both of his parents are employed with government contracted companies or were in the past? Uh, I was not aware of some of that, but it doesn't surprise me. I, I think I knew about the Langley thing, and which is funny because technically, if you wrote me a letter right now and put it in the mail, I am living in Langley, Washington. So I'm living in Langley, WA. He's living, used to live in Langley, VA. And That's by the funny. way, yeah, and it, it, Langley is, by the way, a fairly common name. Like there's a Langley, British Columbia, not even 40 miles from here, maybe 50 miles from here. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, I, I get it. I, Eric, I don't consider him really, again, that suspicious. Has he been somewhat destructive? But come on, I, I've known people in the music industry and the people in, in, the, in the sound and stage industry. It's, it's, a, it's a very old tale, right? Where the actors hate each other. Musicians hate each other. As soon as, like, if, if you're at a bunch of garage bands and you know each other, the first garage band that signs a, um, uh, a deal, a record deal, they're immediately sellouts. Right. You know, it used yeah. to be about the music, man. And that's what I mean. I caught a lot. Well, I caught some hell with the commercial, to be sure. Um, and I also caught hell for the for the documentary. And yeah. I don't I don't blame people for it. But at the same time, it's like, look, uh, what, what's the saying that I love so much? Uh, a rising tide raises all boats. Which is like, look, it helped the community. There was so much exposure because of the documentary, and yeah, I yeah. knew the community was going to hate. Well, it. anybody who knows anybody who knows anything about editing, obviously, that wouldn't be a reason to think you're a shill. Anybody who knows anything about editing, so to yeah. me, that didn't that that was nothing. But with Eric Dubay, yeah, I don't know when your whole fa when you and your whole family are from Langley, Virginia, yeah. and. There were guys, I forgot the guy's name. He did a huge deep dive into Dubai. And keep in mind, I actually don't know if this guy was or wasn't a flat earther. But he right. did He did a ton of research. He pulled up all the personnel records, everybody's LinkedIn. And both of his parents apparently worked or still work for government companies. Huh? I and mean, it's... I, I think you might be right there because he th th his parents may have helped him. If you know some of the backstory, you know, he the reason why he was in Thailand was because he jumped in at the last minute on a medical class action lawsuit back in the 90s. I oh, believe. I didn't know this. 
Yeah. And he won, I think, six figures, you know, like 100, 110, 120 grand. Right. And so like with some people, he, he was like, oh, hey, where can I go that 120 grand is going to take me a long way? Thailand. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, freaking that is where you, if you can pull off, you know, the language and, and it's like, OK, so he teaches, you know, yoga and martial arts over there. And my one of my favorite stories about him was it wasn't even about him. It was it was what Owen Benjamin talked about him. And Owen Benjamin just came up with us on the fly. Sharp guy sometimes. And he and he said because you know Owen Benjamin used to be about used to be about the whole Hollywood LA scene. You know he did. I actually Chris. remember I actually remember him from Hollywood. Like, I remember way back in the day oh, yeah. he, he was pretty he was semi famous. Yeah, he was he was a B list. Um, yeah. but he he dated Christina Ricci, which of all people I like, didn't wow. even know I didn't even know that. But wow. <laughs> yeah, and so he used to go all the Hollywood parties, and what he said was, when you go to these Hollywood parties, they all played out sort of the same, and eventually you run to a party where they talk about there will all be these whispers about some guy at the back of the party doling out sage like wisdom, right? Like like an like an Andy Warhol wannabe. And he just made up a name. He goes, let's just call him Savanye, right? Which is a great name. <laughs> and it's like, he goes, Eric Dubé is like Savanye to me. He goes, I hear about this guy all the freaking time, right? It's like, oh, you know, Eric Dubé does this and there. You know, because again, he's got that myth about him, which is, oh, he lives in Thailand. He teaches martial arts and yoga. Sometimes he raps and he just doles out truth. And to and Eric really milks it to where you know now people you know they, they don't even know he's more more legend than anything else. Um, with me, I try to get everything up front, which is why my very first Strange World episode, um, because I do I do have a criminal past, no question, uh, and I'm not shy about telling people. Um, it is if you want to listen to a fun story, it Strange World number one is called Fireworks, where I made illegal fireworks. Oh, during... I remember you. I don't I don't think it was I I must have. It must have been some interview that I heard because I do remember you mentioning this story on an interview. I brought it up a couple times, but yeah. I laid out my first Strange World episode. I had three glasses of wine, had a co-host because I wasn't brave, and you know, nine years ago, and told the story in length at length, and just you know, laid out the whole story. It takes about two hours to to tell the story um, because there's a lot of Native American reservations up here in Washington. And they sell, you know, the 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 rules for Na reservations are different, right? And taxes. Yeah. yeah, we did some things in the Native Americans. So, you know, we're, we're just going to let them do whatever they want. Yeah. And sell fireworks under the table. They still can't sell legal fireworks above the above the table, but below the table they can. And somebody's got to make it for them. And I was pretty good at chemistry. So <laughs> I made them a, a whole bunch of stuff and I got hit for it. The ATF hit me years ago, decades ago now. And because of that, I wanted full disclosure. I because of what you just said there, I did not want anyone doing a deep dive into my past and saying, "Did you? Oh, Mark was a federal criminal." It's like, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, I was. But they waited to hit me until. But I wait was a second. What? Wouldn't that make you less likely to be a shit? I would think so. Well, unless you went the other way and said, "Well, when they hit him, they cut it." You know, do the whole TV movie thing. It's like, well, they cut wait, him when, a deal. Yeah, but what year? But what year was this? Oh, this was uh ninety one. Yeah, that's too. Yeah, but that's that doesn't. If it was, if it was right before you started your flat Earth clues, then yes. There you go. But yeah, but they that, wouldn't have waited yeah. that long. Yeah. If you so, want, but to just use one me, more thing. One yeah. more thing about Eric Dubé, though. Yeah. He seems like his speech pattern is very unusual. Some would say because I've done quite a bit of research into MK Ultra. Right. Um, and that's a that's a deep rabbit hole. Right. And some would say he speaks like someone who has been programmed. And on the second point, his video animations are a little too good, aren't they? Like when he first came out with his Flat Earth videos yeah. and he had all of these uh, renderings of how his perspective renderings, even even the rotation of the stars, like they are a little too good. They were just based very, on a random guy on YouTube. They were very polished, considering how early it was, because he didn't have that many subs when yeah. you know, back in the day. Now nowadays, you know, because you can't stop him from getting a quarter million subs. You can burn down his channel. His channel's been torched two or three times, and yeah. they just keep coming back. In fact, uh, I even I even ran to a guy on the island. Who, clo who clocked me and it's like he saw me he came up to me he wanted to shake my hand but he he was open he goes he goes just so you know 
I hate to say this, but I said bad things about you in chat and comment section. I go, why? He goes, well, because I'm an Eric Dubay guy. <laughs> Get out of here. Are you serious? <laughs> um, but but the only thing that may, ever made me suspicious about Eric ever, the only thing that ever did it, was when the infamous interview, if you've never watched it, it's worth it, when he, Eddie Bravo, interviewed him years ago before the very first Flat Earth Conference in 2017. And there was this moment where, because Ed, Eddie was a big fan of Savanya. Yeah. Oh, he was like buying into it. It's like, oh, Eric, Eric knows the truth, brother. Right. And it's like now and now it's like David Weiss knows the truth, brother. It's he switched. <laughs> right. And he said, hey, I'm going to be out on the on the islands, a nearby island um, doing a judo thing or whatever martial arts thing. Because, you know, he's got he teaches classes wherever he wants to go. And he goes, he goes, you're in a kind of martial arts. He goes, hey, how would you like to come out? I'll give you give you passes and everything. You can you can come out and hang out with me. And Eric, for whatever reason, this goes into the whole programming thing. Eric, for whatever reason, just said, no, 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 I don't think. I, I mean, you'd think that you'd just be nice. It's like, oh, yeah, that'd be kind of fun. Send me some information. Yeah. Or like blow, blow them off quietly. But to say straight up no in five seconds on live a live podcast is like, wow, really? Yeah, you're going to shut down one of your. That's one a little weird. Big, yeah. One of your big fans. So people would then speculate. It's like maybe he can't leave Thailand, you know, because or maybe he's got passport problems. Because if you leave the United States for more than six months without coming back, you got to deal with some oh, extra paperwork and crap. Right, right, right. So yeah. maybe there was something out there that was keeping him in Thailand to where he couldn't leave. But I don't know. Well, I have uh, I have a list. Let me just recap the list for the listeners. Yeah. So from Langley, Virginia family from Langley, Virginia, working in government contracted companies. Yeah. Very unusual speech pattern. Um, animations that seem like they have an entire production team behind them. Mm -hmm. And there's actually another point. He did, a, he did at least one or two videos where he's in drag, which a lot of people think is satanic. So, you know, especially in Hollywood, there's all these satanic connections to, yeah. to, yeah inverting the genders and all of that so that's that's a pretty long list of suspicions it's it's pretty good the the drag thing though i can tell you i know why he did the drag thing because he was he was he was doing a, a bad parody of patricia steer he hated patricia steer because patricia had when she first when she first came out she had massive production value she was ridiculously attractive and she had camera camera savvy and she had already done radio work um, every producer that I ever worked with that that met her or talked to her at any point said um, she was she was the most camera ready person they've ever they've ever seen in any any type of community like this. And so it, it bothered Eric. Eric couldn't compete with that. Couldn't even couldn't even touch that. Um, but to your other points, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you make some make some good points. Eric had it didn't matter too much to me because well, okay, two two points real quick. One. If you're going to be a shill, eventually, because remember, I've been doing this for nine years and Eric's been doing it for over 10 years. Eventually, you're going to go off road and steer the um, uh, the the movement into another direction or renounce it. Right. It's like, oh, no, I was wrong. And then you create huge disharmony in, in the community. And, and who knows what happens after that? Well, here's um, I, are ahead. you familiar with my theory? I say this on every flat earth topic that I cover every podcast where I cover the topic. Hmm. which is because to me, apparently I'm a unique guy. I actually, I'm more fascinated by the argumentation than the conclusion. Yeah, I, I wanted, like listening to your stuff. Yeah, I, I, I care about the logical uh, argumentation because who cares if you're accidentally correct? Like there's plenty of stupid people who accidentally hold correct opinions. That's yeah. not relevant. That doesn't make them smart. They just accidentally latched on to whatever they heard. Sure, so blood. with Dubay, just the final point on Dubay. Yeah. Also, he had seemingly, he has quite a lot of access to information that when he was unloading it, especially Atlantis, because I've, I've studied Atlantis for, for decades. Right. He had information that was not on the internet at that time. Like his whole blog, Atlantean Conspiracy. I don't know if you know. I think that's what it was called. He yeah, had yeah, information yeah. on there. Like I have a pretty large library. They were in these old, obscure Atlantean books that nobody had put online yet. So 
Maybe Eric Dubé really is an organic occult scholar. Maybe. Maybe. But the, the other issue is in some of the interviews, he does not seem as eloquent and informed as on the the pre-recorded videos that he's doing that he did on YouTube, as if he was reading from a script with mm. information, insider information, so to speak. Mm. So that's that's kind of where I look at it. And again, just to clarify for all the listeners, yeah. that does not mean that the information he's bringing forth is false. Because if this this is what fascinated me the most about the flat Earth topic. I don't know if you heard my podcast on my history with geocentrism, because I've been studying geocentrism since uh, 2000. Okay. And there was, I mention this all the time, I do not have this backed up. I used to back up everything and I got in trouble with YouTube because I showed images of the occult NASA patches from their top secret missions. And really? my entire stream got uh, affected. And since then it's been nonstop glitches. This was, this was, maybe five months ago hmm. and it's just been glitched that's one of the reasons it's taken me so long to finally do this interview with you because it's been non-stop glitches and again we even got this i mean i think that was just the power issue i'm not gonna get conspiratorial and say we're being <laughs> we're being interfered with but and this right. isn't live on youtube so you know it shouldn't be i don't think it should be yeah an it issue. shouldn't be that much of a problem live is different but this shouldn't be an issue yeah well I, i'm Unless also really having... paranoid I've, i actually had a computer engineer help me with all of this hardware uh to bypass uh, i can't go, i don't want to go into it too much because i don't want the oh no, no 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 you're fine you're fine. on youtube because when i put this on youtube i don't want them to kind of like just shut down my whole account because they think you know, there's a way to circumvent. I can't really say too much, but right. there are computer engineers that have all this hardware equipment to bypass YouTube server algorithms. Hmm. And so I sh I saved all these. There were a bunch of websites. The, you remember GeoCities from, from the 90s. Sure. There were people post. Like, there was no, there was free speech back then. So you can post any conspiracy you want. And there were, by the year 2000, I forgot the forum. There was a physics forum where over 200 current physics professors were geocentrists. Nice. And we had real, nobody was talking about flat earth at that time, but they were talking geocentrism seriously yeah. because they were actually applying the scientific method and they were saying, this doesn't make sense with the celestial observation. Right. So, that's another thing that kind of made me unique because when Flat Earth got rolled out, I didn't immediately go, oh, that's super stupid. I'm like, geocentrism, there's a lot there. And I've been studying Tesla and Einstein forever, so I'm already familiar with the, the bunk of relativity, how it's right. bunk. Right. So for me, like all the all the talking points of all these people defending the globe, they've already been debunked and it has nothing to do with Flat Earth. That's just geocentrism and relativity being debunked. Most people don't know about that stuff. And one of the things I talk about on my podcast all the time is scientism as opposed to science. And most people, this is why like Neil deGrasse, my, my main criticism of guys like Neil deGrasse Tyson and any scientist in the mainstream, they never once uttered the word scientism. If they were legitimate scientists, they would be warning of the dangers of scientism. Like, look at any religion, like even Christianity, like so-called true Christians. They warn of the false teachers and the charlatans, like, because they, they truly believe what they're saying. Yeah. With these guys, like, how could Neil deGrasse Tyson not be a shell? <laughs> or well, you could say yeah. he's just really dumb. No, 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 no. You're you're absolutely right, and you, you're, that is a well-made point. Which is science rarely, if ever, publicly goes against its own. Um, behind the scenes, you'll have scientists quibbling over you know this and that. You know, there's some famous stories about that. But when it comes to Neil Tyson, I think he's a shill only in that he is given scripts to read and he's given positions to to fill but they don't give him the backstory of why he's doing it meaning it's better to have neil be authentic in his delivery because he's a great i always give this he is a great salesman and he has amazing stage presence he could do anything along those lines he could he could do self-help books 
he could do um, corporate presentations. It's just blind freaking luck or whatever you want to call it <laughs> that that he is in physics that that he's doing it because for, from the science standpoint, and I don't ever wish him you know to trip and fall on like five or six bullets, but if he did, he doesn't have an understudy. Meaning there's there's no way to take its place. There's only three media scientists in the world that are that are rolled out in front of the camera, and I'm not counting Bill Nye because he's not. Um, Neil Tyson, uh, Michio Kaku from Japan, and Brian Cox from the UK. Um, but yes, Neil, he actually sometimes he helps us more than he than he hurts us, especially you know with the comments you're well versed in with you know like with that presentation where he was criticizing Felix Baumgartner and the oh, Red yeah, Bull yeah, job. Yeah. It was a great one. Great one. It's like, yeah, that that he should have never gone down that road because we use that we use that term all the time. Or well, says that it's pear shaped. Go ahead. Let me circle back to what I was saying before. With my theory is that so it almost doesn't matter within this theory of shields. It doesn't matter whether flat Earth is true or not because similar to the way Alex Jones is just allowed to have a show and be anti government. One right. of the theories is to roll out the new world order. You need to stir up more opposition to get the civil war going. Yes. So if the if the goal is a new world order, regardless of flat earth is true or not, like we could say, if it's true, they let the cat out of the bag. And that's why people think that Matt Powerland is a shield too, because he apparently worked for NASA. And or you, you're saying he did? I I know the I know. I, it's taken me a while to piece that together, but I I know what happened there. Um, Matt wasn't necessarily a shill. What he was was in the right place at the right time, and even he didn't know. Because again, if you you know Matt's Matt, you want to do a deep have somebody do a deep dive. Do a deep dive on Matt. Fascinating, his his freaking trajectory, which was you know he's an artist. But we'll say this: I I consider him a really good painter. Um, out of Montreal, who also, but he wanted everything, right? He had a huge ego and he wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a singer. He wanted to be a comedian and he had high confidence they could pull these things off. And so, you know, he went down to Holly. Good looking guy, by the way, in the 20s. He was an actor. I mean, I saw him in in, in bit part acting roles in, in Hollywood. He actually made it down there to Los Angeles. And I think at one point he made friends because of his painting circles. He made friends with one of the graphical graphic guys at NASA. And the story goes, and you, you probably saw it on the documentary, you know some of this, which was, I don't think he worked for NASA. He got his paychecks from NASA directly. I think he removed a degree yeah. of separation. Yeah, meaning yeah. He, he painted a guy's, he painted some stuff like a room at a NASA guy's house in the Hamptons. That's why he was there. And Matt is not a fast painter, really interesting painter. And, you know, he's, again, that's another Savanye where he's painting all the stuff. It's going to take a while and he's going to charge X number of dollars. And whoever the NASA guy was, was fascinated with it. And it's like, oh, well, I'm not going to wait till this guy's done. I'm going to throw a party, you know, with all my NASA mucky muck friends. And that's how the story goes, where it's like, hey, Matt, you should go too. you're a good looking painter. You're obviously going to be one of the more interesting guys in the room. And Matt. When everything's being laid out in front of him, which I love, it was again it was the most, only only coherent interview he ever did, and it was his girlfriend interviewing him sober on a Sunday morning. Thank God. <laughs> and seriously, it was the only sober thing I ever saw him do that wasn't or wasn't drug fueled. And where he says, you know, that when they drew, you know, the UN map on the floor, you know, where everything and the guy was describing how energy worked and the thermal transfers and all this stuff, that he's he was looking at the UN flag, and. He didn't understand it, even under, you know, again, it was like 25, 26 when this happened for years, several years later, when it's like, you know, it dawned, I was like, wait a minute, they weren't talking metaphorically. They were talking like it was real. And then he tried to make phone calls and no one was answering his call. And, and by that time, he was already going down a rabbit hole. Um, do I think he worked for NASA directly? No, no, I don't think he got his paycheck. But the story sounds better if he says that so he worked for NASA. Let me, I'm going to give you a mind shock. I've never told this story before on mind Go shock. I'm going to tell it right now with you. Okay. But so you believe that that story really happened uh, out in the Hamptons. Yeah. It sounds it it's, I, I think it happened because it sounds, it, it is a great, it is a great story. Meaning, yeah. you know, if I was going to shoot it, if I was going to film it, Oh, that, that is so easy to film. Uh, so and, and it, so here's the thing. 
Yeah. I I actually heard that story told by somebody else before. Not exactly, but the story of NASA insiders. Um, I don't have a source for this, unfortunately. Oh, no, I'm actually ahead. that's why I haven't told the story before because I always bring the receipts. If you watch my uh, 25 hour Steven Seagal podcast, I bring <laughs> I bring receipts for every single claim with Seagal, okay. with on everything. I don't have the receipts for the story, which is why I haven't told it, but I thought it was relevant to share. Okay, I'm not saying that uh, he stole the story. Maybe it happened to him. But this story, it was around. I, I really, I was trying to find it, and I, I couldn't find it. It was, and again, I don't even know if the story's true. But the the story, as written with NASA insiders, kind of laughing about the joke of of the flatter. So I also, I'm not a hundred percent sure what the terminology used was. I don't sure. remember. But that story, a very very similar story, existed on the internet before. The question then becomes, again, comes down to date and timestamp. The first time Matt said it on camera would have been 2014. But the story itself, if you believe the story, would have happened late 90s. Maybe okay, so so here's the next question. Yeah. Did he tell people right after it happened? And no. they put it online? I can't imagine he would. Well, I mean, it's possible. I mean, again, if you can find a version of it, possibly. Yeah. I mean, he might have. But I don't think the, – the reason why I don't think so is because he – I don't think, again, being a dumb painter-actor kid back, you know, in your mid-20s, I don't think he I don't think he understood the story until well, years so later. When, when I first ahead. read it online, I didn't know what I was reading either because they didn't say Flat Earth. Hmm. It was something like the world is not what you think it – it was – that was the gist of it. Yeah, and he didn't. And when when he told the story, he didn't. Well, he mentioned flat, but he. I don't think he said flatter directly when he when he talked about. You know what it, would be funny? I don't know if you still talk to him, but is Matt? it possible? Yeah. Oh God, no, Matt. Matt hates me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Matt doesn't um, call. I me don't anymore. know. I don't know all of the who's who or anything. That's all right. Um, yeah. I mostly just analyze the logic of the debates, but yeah. Uh, it would be interesting if he posted his own story anonymously, and that's the older one. That would be interesting. And that 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 is possible, except that Matt was not a um, social media guy early on. He was very hands-on, tactile painting. I'll try to, yeah, I'll try but, to. But track yeah, it you down. can find it. I'd love yeah. to. I'd love to sort that out. But do I think that this this story is possibly true? I do because it is such a great spooky story. You know yeah. where you have basically unknown uh x-files smoking man types yeah. walking around a party you know when the power goes out it's you know the power goes out and they're down to candles and wine and everyone knows if you're even at a party when it goes down to candles and wine or even a bonfire and wine people love telling stories and the stories were crossing over between different groups in the aerospace industry and everyone kept chiming in with more things and it got spookier and spookier until finally one guy you know, start laying it all out, you know, just like, okay, let's get closure on this, how this whole thing works. And it was, it was very compelling um, to where it was enough for me when I heard it in 2014 to, um, to, to start doing the research on my own. Again, thinking it's like, okay, it's a good story, but it's not true. Yeah. Right. There's, there's no way the earth could be flat and therefore <laughs> I'm going to disprove it and then change my life forever and, and ruin everything. So, yeah. And to your point, too, I actually knew someone who worked at NASA as a computer engineer. Oh, did and you? And when, when you talk about compartmentalization, a lot of people don't understand that. It, it's true. That person, because uh, I asked them, and they they had no opinion at all on Flat Earth. Uh, I don't think they even considered it seriously, but they were honest. They were like, we have no idea what this is used for. Like, we have a task. We we execute our task yeah. and we deliver the data. We have no clue what anything is outside yeah. of the task. Compartmentalization is extremely powerful and very very useful. People, you know, I I brought it up before the Manhattan Project. Doesn't matter if you believe in nu nuclear weapons or not. Which is the Manhattan Project went from inception to delivery, and never leaked. Right? It, it, it you know that was that was six figures worth of people. 
and it, it never ever leaked you know and they they wiped out cities and and no one you, secrets can, absolutely can be kept need to know extremely powerful which is why i reference um capricorn one that wonderful scene which is so glossed over in that movie where the young computer programmer who knew something was wrong but again he didn't know what he just said you know where where he goes into the bar and he was telling uh, elliot gould his reporter friend and he said there's no way the transmissions could have come from 70 miles away right and as soon as he said that right all of a sudden a fake call comes to the bar because there were no cell phones when this movie was made back in 1978 elliot gould walks to the bar you know walks to the bar there's no one on the other end of the phone. He turns around to go back to the pool table where his friend is. His friend is gone. The drink's still on the pool table, and his friend has been erased from the rest of the movie. They got him out of there, and when he goes to his friend's house the next day to check on him, the, the apartment that he was living in, there's a, someone else living there, and all the <laughs> magazines have the correct labels on them, like this lady's been living there for years. It's like, what are you talking about? I was just here. Yeah. And and she's like, get out of here. I'm going to call the police, right? And by the time he got out of that apartment, they already clipped his brakes. <laughs> They're trying to kill him. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I mean, people well, you know, The other thing I touched upon, too, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, there was no Photoshop during the moon landing. He's like, I went over the green screen technology used in the early 1900s. I mean, this is old technology. They right. pretty much developed, like, the matte scanning and everything in the, 18, in the late 1890s. Right. So, and I even showed images from uh, a few movies from the 20s and 30s where they use CG, like the precursor to CGI. Right. right. Yeah. So photos... the fakery, they've been doing fakery for a really long time. Well, ever since there's been photos, it's the first yeah. thing you do with photos. I'm going to blame women for, for a lot of it, <laughs> which is the first thing you do is you touch up photos, right? Yeah. The photo touch ups and photo editing has been there minute one. Which is like, okay, well, we don't like how, what can we do to make this photo or movie look better? Well, it's and actually, yeah, the, it actually goes even further because even presidents had touch ups on their paintings and, and they even go. changed people's heads. Uh, you Perfect. know, it was yeah. for whatever reason, I call them the coincidence theorists as opposed to the conspiracy theorists because they believe all these things are coincidence. That's why I use that term so often because it gets people thinking. Like yeah. you're calling somebody a conspiracy theorist because they're aware that criminals don't always act alone. Criminal right. conspiracies prosecuted every day. I think you even mentioned that before too. Oh yeah. It's prosecuted yeah. every day. Yeah. Every day. But I was, I was hit with it. I didn't even know it yeah. existed. People think, Oh, conspiracy is <laughs> a bad word. It's like it's used in the court system all the time. If you're a bank robber, if you rob a bank today, you'll get hit with armed robbery. But if you rob a bank with two of your friends, yeah. you get hit with bank robbery and conspiracy to commit yeah. robbery meaning you co conspired with your with your friends there are I, I, it drives me insane and i know it's human nature which is like everyone's got their own wheelhouse um if but there are conspiracies in every aspect of our lives all the time in business and politics and sports and entertainment and yes in um um journalism and science if they're there all the time it's just that most people don't want to I, I would know. actually i would actually argue science actually has more conspiracies than any other field not sure. less <laughs> sure well, well hey let me rattle let me rattle off a couple for you really fast which is because i love throwing it back at science like okay science never does anything wrong right ever and they and they don't want to admit it i go i go i don't know let's just do america you know since the turn of the century um scientists thought that doling out heroin at drugstores was great or creating <laughs> a cola that was cocaine flavored or i don't know lead paint lead gasoline DDT, all the variations of DDT, asbestos, which, by the way, I actually like as a product. A lot of good things you can do with asbestos, unless you work in the factory, then you're screwed. Yeah. Um, or all the scientists that took the money and said that smoking was fine and secondhand smoke was a myth. Don't tell me. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, science is you know, the, the whole thing of science. Is my, my biggest problem with science or scientism is they don't apologize and they're never really that accountable when things go wrong. They just chalk it up and it's like, well, you know, we're just going to revise our theory. Come well, I on. actually think it's much more sinister than that because they can't admit they're wrong because they need the faith of the masses to keep their pockets lined. Because as soon yeah. as as soon as scientism is, is exposed, the grift is over. They can't trick you with cigarettes. They can't trick you with sugar science. 
They right. can't trick you with anything with any kind of a medical treatment. The jig is up. The jig yeah. is up once scientism is exposed. And that's why they never talk about scientism. And that's why, like, the, the most basic way I break it down, if you're following the scientific method objectively instead of presupposing a conclusion, then you're a scientist. If you're just peddling propaganda without showing your work, like you can claim the right. study proves. How does it prove? Notice this is completely absent from the mainstream. There's right. never a demonstration of how it proves it. Like what's the dependent variable? What's the independent variable? What were the controls? How do you know that this result is legitimate? It's never any of that. It's just like, oh. They said, and 90% of the time they're lying because when you pull up the study, it doesn't even say what they said it said. Right. Like with the recent uh, medical treatments for the event, uh, if you, I actually went through them. I actually read hundreds of them because yeah. I was curious. I'm a curious guy. And <laughs> everything that they, the FDA was saying, everything that the CDC was saying, that's not what their own study linked on their own website was showing yeah. but everybody's too lazy to, to to actually look at that yeah yeah the laziness yeah uh, i there was a wonderful movie quote and i i can't remember or was it scanner darkly where it's like what is the most common human react or emotion is it is it laziness or is it fear it's like oh that's a tough one <laughs> sometimes it's tough. both yeah it's really it's, tough yeah yeah, so one of the reasons I actually wanted to talk to you was mm -hmm. I like the fact that you go off on tangents because we get to discuss things that otherwise we wouldn't have gotten to. So we went off we went off on so many tangents, but I just want to finish yeah. my point earlier where regardless of whether flat earth is true or not, if the mm -hmm. goal is to get a new world order, martial law rollout whatever, everything that Alex Jones see there's a couple things that don't that kind of don't make sense. So I also wanted to ask your opinion on Bill Cooper and your history with conspiracy. You kind of mentioned, if if I remember correctly, JFK yeah. started your conspiracy research. Yeah, I I started out um, getting. I was raised on a on an on a rural island up near Canada. So it's about it's about as disconnected from anything. I didn't even know there was more than one religion, honestly, until I left and. When I saw my first exposure to conspiracies at all, except for, you know, the obvious like Bigfoot or, or UFOs or, or stuff like that, which was just books in a random bookstore, was uh, JFK the movie by Oliver Stone back in the yeah. early 90s. And I remember seeing it with a pa in a packed house. You know, I, it was an, a, an amazing experience. And I remember everyone when I came, when I came out of that, never seen a theater so agitated about this because he shot it in a way where if you know anything about how, you know how to brainwash he interspliced his footage with the you know, with authentic period piece footage to where it seemed it was very pretty seamless and at that point it's like oh maybe people in power do make you know bad decisions or decisions on their on their for the greater good right and then I, you know, slowly but surely as the, the computer world started up, you know, when the internet, because there were no rabbit holes to go down, then 9-11 happened. And I'm trying to be careful about what I say here. Um, when 9-11 when happened, then things started picking up and the rabbit holes got bigger and deeper. And that's when I really got into it to where I would go down every rabbit hole I could think of. And mostly because I had the time to do it because I never got married or had kids. So I went down everything you could think of and had an opinion on just about everything you could think of. So again, um, you know, JFK was a lone gunman The in turn was killed by a lone gunman. Probably not. Um, probably more to it than that. Um, but do I um, think that um, that Bigfoot is currently dating the ghost of Elvis? Probably not. You know, there's some things but I like. You'd be some... open. You'd be open to seeing the evidence of it existed. Oh, yeah. And I've told people that I go because once I got into flat earth, right, everything else was back on the table and it would be hypocritical. So now I'd say, oh, fine. So you say Bigfoot's pregnant. And it's Elvis. OK, I'll give you a couple of minutes. What do you got? <laughs> and and I, I'm not kidding. I, I because what 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 leg do I have to stand on? I wake up with flat earth every day. And once you're into that, it's the big umbrella that covers everything else and every, everything is possible. Why, if you can lie about some stuff, why, why couldn't you lie about that? And the, again, which is, 
Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was a little weird. Even though I was into geocentric, I've studied geocentrism for a long time. Mm -hmm. All of these different conspiracies in the occult, I actually think the occult is inextricably linked with conspiracies. Because sure. everything kind of from the secret, regardless of whether you believe what the secret societies believe is true regarding the gods and Satanism and all that, they believe it's true. Oh, yeah. So, the, the real yeah. society. Yeah. Watch, spend a couple of hours looking at yeah. those guys. Yeah. Right? Or whatever they're doing at Bohemian Grove. So right. they believe it's true. There's there's an occult subtext to everything. And just from studying, I don't know. I don't. I really, when I was studying all this stuff, I didn't think I was that unique that I was studying logic and, and psychology and philosophy all at the same time with occult spirituality. Right. <laughs> and when you go back and look at the ancients, all of their wisdom regard, I mean, everything from astronomy to psychology to the to cosmology and, right. and even the Mayans talking about the demurge, the matrix, the illusionary reality. Yeah. They had all these concepts. Again, who knows how long ago it was. Once you're going into the Tartaria rabbit holes, we don't really know how long ago that was. Yeah. But but they they knew all these things and yet we're we're kind of scientism posits that they were that ignorant. Like for example, the Mayan calendar needs one adjustment every 52 years. And right. they can build pyramids that show shadows of snakes on solstices. And yet they don't know what the shape of the earth is. Now, again, I'm not saying they're correct. I'm just exposing how silly the scientism position is right. to, to dismiss. Modern, modern scientists are not building pyramids that can cast shadows on solstices. Right. Now, when they start doing that, <laughs> then then we can take their position a little bit more seriously, where basically they just made a bunch of assumptions. And obviously, again, as anybody who goes back through this past century and actually looks at every piece, like even Einstein's Nobel Prize is based on the hoax, the, the eclipse data hoax, which was right. admitted by Eddington. Right. So a lot of people don't know that. They don't teach that in school. No. So no. when his entire Nobel Prize, they also don't teach that when government schooling was adopting the new physics curriculum, they consulted Einstein for the textbooks and they flat out asked him to his face. This story, I believe it's in Physics Magazine. I forgot which issue. I have it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's the full article. And they basically said, so either Maxwell was correct or you're correct. Which is it? And Einstein was like, well, obviously I'm correct. <laughs> now, Maxwell's not there. <laughs> so right. isn't it like, can you say conflict of interest? Like, it's just so weird. And all of modern physics is built on that fraud. When you're right. building a house of cards, and people don't understand that. So when, when anything comes up flat earth, I actually, if you notice, I don't really even spend the time debating the, the earth being flat. I'm simply looking at the inaccuracies of the side of scientism in the globe because right. it's kind of embarrassing. Like if if you are if you believe the world is a heliocentric globe and you don't know about the basics of physics history, what are you doing in this debate? Like it's really yeah. silly. It to me, science is just uh, magic without mystery. Uh, something I came up with a while ago, and you're you're absolutely right. It is stunning to me. We've only really been pushing this part for the last couple of years. What you just said there, which is, it's amazing when you ask the average person on the street, you know, just the stuff that we know, the the scientific factoids, you know, like how how fast is the Earth rotating, how fast is it going around the sun, how fast is a solar system flying sideways through the galaxy, blah blah blah. We know all these things, and they don't know any of them. Right. And yeah. so the question is, why are you defending or how are you even thinking you're going to defend a model which you don't even know your own basics? You know, it, it's one thing to say, well, it, you say, well, it's in a book somewhere. It's like, yeah, but you don't know it. Why? It's all because it's obvious. It's like, really? According to according to who? Um, There's a line. You, you probably know this one. Um, George Orwell. It's a quote I, I put in the description box of, of every video I make where George Orwell, you know, 1984, he said in uh, 1946 he wrote this little thing and he was again not a flat earther but he was talking how people will believe the authority of science 
just because, right? Just because they have lab are coats. You sure? and are you sure he was in a flat earth? <laughs> well, he, he, I think he was so against what, what he was against was the, the fact that if you put on a lab coat and, you know, hold a clipboard and just start pointing fingers and rattling off stuff, people will believe you because they think, well, this person's obviously smarter yeah. than me. And he said, when you walk up to the average person on the street and you ask them how they know the world is a globe, they'll just come back immediately, knee-jerk response, and say, oh, well, 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 it's known, right? It is known. It's a given, like algebra, right? which they don't know. <laughs> and <laughs> then um, you say, really? How do you know? And then the gears start grinding because then they realize it's not that they know. They were told. And there's a big difference in that. It's like, okay, just because your father was told, his father going back several generations, doesn't mean it's true. It just means the story was passed down. You don't know for sure on your own. I mean, and the, and the bigger question, which he, I think he was putting out there, was this was 1946. NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. How did everybody in the world know it was a globe when there was no space program at all in 1946? Because the scientists told them there were no spaceships. There's nothing. Nothing along those like hell, the, the war had just ended. So yeah. how'd you know? And uh, they, they don't. And that, that bothers people. And he said people get agitated when you push them on this. And he was talking about the responsibility of science. It's like, you better be right, was yeah. what he was basically saying, if you're going to start pushing this stuff. But it isn't. You know how that goes, which is it's a slippery slope. Once science figured out that they could start just start throwing this stuff out there and people will buy it, what's to stop them? You know, there's, there's no one checking them. Especially what you said earlier, which is like they don't they don't turn against their own. So it's like, oh, it's got to be true. Oh, look, gravity waves. Really? Oh, yeah, it seems legit. Oh, look, well, there's George, water on Mars. There's George also... Carlin actually has one of my favorite. He has so many great ones. But yeah. my favorite one is that is one that nobody I've never heard anybody repeat it other than myself. What? You don't need a formal conspiracy when interests converge. So oh, that's these, good. Yeah. So these that's people. Good. These people don't need to be in a room with each other plotting. It's simply, it's, I also use the example of uh, when everybody says, oh, all the space agencies can't be in on it. This is no different than the mafias, whether it's the Russian mafia, the Italian mafia. Whenever it's something that threatens their institution, they're on the same side. They'll fight with each other for territory and whatever. But if there is some kind of threat that threatens their ability, same thing with slave plantation owners. They're competing against other plantations. Their cotton is better. But it, as soon as something threatens the institution of slavery, all of a sudden they're on the same side and they don't have to go to a meeting to be on the same side. Funny so that's kind of, it's kind of obvious. And, and all of this goes to the reason why, like, I don't take sides on anything except I'm on the side of logic. That's right. why I think studying logical fallacies and psychology is so important. And they stopped teaching it in schools somewhere around the early 90s. They sure. just completely removed it from the curriculum because it used to be in the curriculum. You used to have to write an essay utilizing logic, deductive reasoning, etc., and explain it. That completely disappeared somewhere around the early 90s. Yeah, deductive reasoning is dangerous for a population <laughs> that you're trying to keep just smart enough that they can keep the machine running, but not too smart, you know this, not too smart that they start questioning things they they don't want to question. Um, did did I ever tell you? Um, did you ever hear me talk about the uh, the prehistoric fish thing? Do I have time to to say that one? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I remember that. You can say it real quick. Yeah. Okay, so the prehistoric fish one. When I when I try to throw p things at people, it's like science. So they um you know because they'll 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 come at me and they say, "Oh, you believe in Loch Ness monster?" And I go, "Fine." Let's look at the, the coelacanth fish, C-O-E-L-A-C-A-M-T-H, fish, right? Prehistoric fish died 70 million years ago. Uh, you know, we've got fossil records, that whole thing, if you believe the carbon dating system. And every, every scientist in the world, this is to, to your point, every scientist in the world would have bet the frickin' farm that that fish was absolutely extinct. And then the British Navy catches one in a net off of South Africa in 1940, right? And they wouldn't believe it, would not accept it. It's like, nope. But obviously, you made a mistake, right? And then they there was another one caught off of um, Mozambique, another one off of Madagascar. So pretty soon they realized it's like, oh crap, Africa's not really that industrialized. No one was paying attention. They're swimming all around Africa, right? To where yeah. National Geographic, you know, finally did a special on them, and they could not deal with it. They could not handle it. And 
to where they were like they had to make up they had to backtrack and make up new scientific terms just to explain the damn fish right where it's like well it's a living fossil and it's in an evolutionary state of stasis it's like oh really 70 million years never changed a single thing on it okay fine and then and they go what's your point my point is um uh they say well you believe in Loch Ness Monster and and, and they say well, that's ridiculous and I, I go why they go well because it's been extinct for at least like 100 million years oh you mean like that fish yeah. over there that that fish so you were absolutely i love the look on their face when i do it to them i go that fish you were absolutely wrong you and every one of your friends was absolutely wrong but you're pretty solid on the loch ness thing that there can't be any sort of reptile swimming around in a yeah. dark murky lake in, in freaking scotland drives it, me freaking insane it gets really funny because because i've studied cryptozoology i was always interested in cryptozoology as well i love cryptozoology and yeah. The, the mountain gorilla was, a, I believe it was officially discovered in the 1970s, I believe, if I have that correct. Oh, yeah. That's pretty yeah. recent for this giant mammal. We're not talking about a little insect. No. This look giant up, mammal. After we're done, look up something called the billy ape. That was only 10, 15 years ago. Wow, it a, yeah. it's a It's a six-foot-tall chimp that is really gun-shy, a little play on words there, of humans for good reason, right? And they found a dead one that, that some villagers had put in a hut. It's like, holy yeah. crap, this thing's huge, right? And and it's like, then the only reason we did not find it is because every time they saw people, they're like, oh, no, 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 we're gone. How It was it was hard. The giant panda, absolutely a myth. And yeah. you know what? I'm going to go with science on that one. It's like, it sounds ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, so it's a cuddly black and white bear that just lies on its back all day and eats bamboo. Okay, sure. There it is. Yeah, I actually it. have, I have like a list of other things we didn't even get to because we're having so much fun. I'm going to try to get to them though. So okay. your, your no. opinion, so you started with JFK. Did you ever look into Bill Cooper and John Lear? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to miss Bill Bill Cooper and, yeah. and and John Lear. Um, I love I love some of the stories, the spooky the spooky base stories. Um, if I ever had a wish list, if there was a government, it's like okay, we'll give you one wish wish before we get you know firing squad you. It's like take me to the Hall of Nightmares in in, in the Dulce the Dulce base in New yeah. Mexico. Take me to that. I'd love to see it <laughs> because it yeah. sounds so freaking wild. Um, anyway, go ahead. Sorry, so, I want to be um, want to be brief. On the subject of shills, though, so yeah. Bill Cooper killed under mysterious circumstances. Alex Jones still alive. So some people, what's your opinion on Alex Jones in terms of shill? Alex Jones is useful. Period. Um, and again, I'm I'm going to talk from a let's pretend because I love putting myself in other people's shoes. If I was a go in a government, I could in another lifetime, I absolutely could have worked for a government think tank. Absolutely could have done it because I, I get it. I get the whole great. It might not be too late. They might want to recruit you. Uh, I'm a little old. I mean, Joe, Joe Rogan, he was, he got it at a perfect time. I think where he actually looked at the camera, such a great quote. It's like, you know, he goes, guys, call me. <laughs> he goes, I will sell my own mother. You ever seen that clip? Yeah, I did. And then, well, and then he gets the TV show after. Well, funny how that works. What a like, coincidence. And I, I love, I would have loved to have been in that meeting. Cause it'd be like, dude, you asked, you were dumb enough. You said it on television. what do you think we were going to do? Not call you. Well, um, I'm going to get into Joe in a moment. I just wanted to touch upon Bill Alex. Cooper, John Lee, or Alex Jones? Yeah, Al Alex Jones, uh, he he would be useful in this case because, you, again, what, what you said earlier, which is that you not only do you want to kind of use him to polarize, but you can also use him to kind of see who's out there, you know, who's yeah. who's following Alex Jones. I mean, any anybody can be tracked. Everything is tracked now. So whoever's, whoever's sending stuff, oh, Alex is great. And, you know, not just the people <laughs> that buy his T-shirts and, yeah. and stuff, just people that talk about him. You know, all that's tracked. So yeah, Alex Jones useful. Why? Why would? Why kill him? Are you kidding? I mean, who's going to replace him right now? Uh, Stu Peterson. Well, definitely not that guy that was uh, doing the debate with Austin Witsit. I mean, what was that guy's name? That guy was one of the silliest guys I have ever. That was one of the worst debates. Yeah, I, have I wouldn't seen. have used him. I wouldn't have used him. I would use somebody else. I mean, he was just reading from a script. Well, hold on now. If the goal, so this is my theory on flat earth, again, regardless whether it's true or not, yeah, I think the reason why they're having the absolute silliest people, because these, these anti-flat earth people, I call them anti-flat earth grifters, like these people that come out with entire channels yeah. just to debunk something that's supposedly so silly and can't be true and, and is dumb. They they do it on purpose to increase flat earth memberships to distrust authority so that similar way that they allow Alex Jones to operate 
So that way they can justify unleashing the martial law, the new world order, et cetera, because nobody trusts authorities. Possibly. I mean, we we were, I've said it many times, we were helped for the first three years from 2015 to 2018. We were promoted. Absolutely. There's some wonderful videos on my channel uh, to where the algorithms were absolutely letting us just run ripshot over, over the internet. We were, we were crushing it. And then yeah. they pulled us back. Then they demonetized the channels um, then, and, and, and crank the governor down to where, yeah. you know, so again, they didn't hit the brakes. They didn't, con you know, knock right. out channels, but they took yeah. the foot off the gas. That's for sure. So, so the other thing before we get to Joe Rogan, yeah. Project Bluebeam or Operation Bluebeam. I'll believe it when I see it. I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been hoping for a Bluebeam thing, kind of like I've been hoping for. I was a Nibiru guy back in the day, you know. Way, you know, it's like yeah, every year. <laughs> oh, I, I, it's like, oh man, that would. I mean, again, the the movie, um, Melancholia, which is a Nibiru movie, you know, involving um Kirsten Dunst and um. Uh, Alexander Skarsgård. I actually Skarsgård. haven't seen that one. Oh God, watch it if you get a chance. It, that's all it is. It is a freaking new bureau movie disguised as an art house picture, uh, shot in shot I in Europe. I didn't even know that. Kirsten Dunst is the lead. It's like, in fact, you can even skip to the second half. You don't want to go through the the first part. That's pretty boring. Um, the second part, I mean, trailer. You know, spoiler alert: world dies. <laughs> right, the binary star system. You know, it's it's pretty much what what you thought with the bureau, but blue beam. The same thing, like if Nibiru all of a sudden showed up in the sky right now, I'd be like, where have you been? <laughs> it's like, you are so out of your timetable because everybody, you know, was was predicting stuff back then. Bluebeam, I'd love to see it um, in real life. You know, so, I was I'm think, sad. So Sorry, I think ahead. I think the way I understand it and Serge Monas, one of the OG conspiracy theorists, I did a video on him. A lot of people don't know about him. He he was even predating. He was before Bill Cooper. Okay. And he wrote a book that uh, we'll get in trouble for going into the exact details, but some of the uh, trans agenda and depopulation, he wrote that in the 60s. Oh, wow. He started writing his book, I think, in the 60s, came out early 80s. Bill Cooper's on the scene late 80s. Yeah. So he and he he mysteriously gets brought into police custody age 50 ish. Next yeah. day, he drops dead. Oh, wow. So he spends a night in jail. Then he comes home next day, drops dead. There and are there are some people that are removed immediately. I have noticed that um, people that they're they either they psychologically profile them or they they look at the the big picture and it's like yeah you know not worth Bobby Kennedy great example um, or the that hacker that um, look that up the guy that there was a hacker that just announced to people it's like oh yeah by the way I can now hack into pacemakers he was gone in a week wow. Uh, like, dude, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah, there's certain guys look look that up. It was like I saw a TV okay. show. I saw a TV show about that kind of recent, but yeah, that's scary stuff. Yeah, that's but again, scary. you know, the government looks out. It's if you if they can't you know, the whole briefcase, Joe Rogan. I know we'll get into it. Um, if the briefcase thing. You offer them the carrot and the stick simultaneously. Yeah. This briefcase has money. This briefcase has a gun. You get to choose. Or again, if they cycle, if they profile you, and it's like, yeah, we already know what he's going to choose. That it's over. Yeah. So, so anyway, Serge, Serge Monast posited that Blue Beam was already operational. So all of the all of the UFOs in the sky are are Blue Beam, and they're playing a long game for the faked alien invasion. So all of Hollywood with the alien movies, and even I still I'm still not a hundred percent sure what Roswell is. If you have like a sixty second soundbite on it. Um, I okay. I sixty second sound about in Roswell. I watched the TV movie. If anyone's never seen it with Kyle MacLachlan um, and Martin Sheen, wonderful movie. I like the story because it, again, I'm a writer first and foremost, and I and there were no plot holes in it. Meaning everyone reacted exactly like they should innocently until the government figured out what the hell was going on and then the government just wiped the slate clean and and made sure it, it was turned into a a myth or a legend i am a big believer in fact i'll send you a wonderful little video um the the well okay two things really fast aside from roswell the greatest ufo sighting in in history was not roswell um in 1940 how oh, was that 1946 or 1947 i can't remember up top of my head, or 1899 Aurora, Texas. It was 1561 Nuremberg, Germany. Yeah. Look that up. Yeah, the, I remember the wiki, that one. The wiki page is there just was one. There was a huge one in ancient China. 
that I oh, actually sure. went over on my podcast as well. Nice. Um, but uh, there's there's a wonderful video I'll send you. There's a there's a great UFO sighting. I believe in them. I I used to watch them. Do I believe that all of them are blue beam? No. Um, because there's some of them that can't be seen with the naked eye. I, you know, with night vision binoculars, when I was in Colorado, I would lay in the snow and I would just stare at the sky and I knew what I was looking at and they were there so, all the time. So let's not fall for false dichotomies or trichotomies or quadrotities because right. they could be military craft or they could be craft from lands beyond the Antarctic ice they're, wall, they're, if that theory is true. Or one of my favorite theories, they could be interdimensional craft. Yeah, I know. I don't think they're us. That's what I mean. Yeah. The, our, our government, power perceived is power achieved. Our government loves to take credit for crap that, uh, that that's not ours. If, I think I think a certain percentage is is the U.S. government's to, to sure. measure responses. But not all. Not all. I mean, again, some of it predates. Um, I'll yeah. send you a wonderful yeah, little yeah. video of a, um, a uh, one that was shot up here in British Columbia over a, a, a cloudless, windless um, inlet with a bunch of sailboats. And I, I, already, I, I could watch it. I could see what was happening. It was, it was the sun had already gone down. Whatever ship was flying, was didn't have its cloak on because it's like the, they, you, you don't have to have your cloak on if, if it's dark. And they screwed up. It was like no, no, there's too much light, and something happened, and they just flew right over the sailboats, and the, the, all the sailboats are freaking out, and it's yeah. like, what the hell are we looking at? It's great. I'll, I'll send it to you. It's really short. Yeah. No, these are fascinating topics, and I'm sure you're familiar with John Keel of the Mothman prophecies. Yeah. Are yeah, you familiar with where he got most of his information and theories? No. It was a French ufologist called Jacques Vallée. Mm. And so he's like the godfather of ufology, and very few people know about him. His theories, I mean, we're we're going back, I mean, what would that be? That that we're talking 50s, possibly earlier. And this guy, this guy is talking about quantum ideas as well as consciousness so he he posited that these types of phenomenon are not unlike in the in previous civilization cycles and fairy tales whatever you want to call them these supernatural beings he posited that these beings take into account the mind of for lack of a better term the victim like either alien abductions or even alien wit or even a witness to a UFO, whatever's in their head. So if aliens are in their head, they can appear as aliens. Oh, Whereas I gotcha. in previous civilization cycles, it wasn't aliens. It was some kind of a monster or a fairy or a mermaid or whatever. Dragon. So Jacques Vallée yeah. is so ahead of his time with some of these quantum and he, I don't think he called it interdimensional, but when you read the theories, it kind of reads like these are interdimensional beings. So sure. in terms would... of shills also, I think a lot of people might be unknowing shills. Like Bob Lazar, my theory on Bob Lazar is that he's telling the truth yeah. and that he was shown he was shown man-made aircraft and was told that they were extraterrestrial craft. Yeah. And they wanted to see what would happen when he leaked it. There you and go. Because they didn't tell him he could pass every polygraph. Because he's yeah. not in on it. Like, that's the Very. whole point of the experience. And for whatever reason, everybody, like, in the mainstream, like, they can't even consider that as a viable option. Yeah, I like that. And yeah, it, yeah, catch and release. Absolutely. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you? Because again, to your, to your point, why wouldn't they off him almost immediately? The second he started talking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Kind, of, kind of like, kind well, of like, have you heard, Go have ahead. you heard the story where he's, where he's only told this once or twice? Apparently, there were incidents with Men in Black where they did try to off him. I'm not 100% sure if this was – well, I, if you if you listen to my Bob Lazar podcast, yeah. I actually dug up some interesting things on his previous life. He was married previously to a woman with connections to the Hells Angels, and they were CIA infiltrated. So he's got some weird connections going back to his first – even before he ever made it to Los Alamos. I would anyone that says they quote unquote escaped from 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 something like that, you know, like oh they almost got me. I treat it no look. I, I've read so many plot things over the, my decades. Treat it no different than the uh, oh god, what's it called? Wasn't it called the Marathon Man. Oh, I'm gonna have to look it up. It's the Dustin Hoffman movie where they stage a fake rescue, 
right? And during the rescue, they're asking him questions, but the questions are just more interrogation. And then when they realized he wasn't going to ask, they just drove him right back to the torture chamber. <laughs> and but the point was the it was a that's complete, funny. Yeah, it was a fake rescue, yeah. and it was brilliant because the the audience didn't see it coming. So yeah, if you escape Men in Black, it's like that's a great way to. You know, I actually act. hadn't even I hadn't even considered that, but that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, why I actually you? thought he was. I thought he might be lying about that particular incident because apparently. There were there was an incident in his house where it was burglarized or whatever, and he saw guys in suits. Yeah, I don't know the exact. I don't remember. It was so long ago. And there was another incident where they actually opened fire on him on a highway. Sure. And Again, flushing somebody out. You, it doesn't. He doesn't even have to be lying, right? Yeah. All you have to do is is make it close enough. You you add that stress. It's like holy crap, they almost yeah. got me. Yeah. It's good. I wonder. I wonder if I could track down the dates because I because his first interview on Japanese television, he didn't show his face. So he was in the dark, if you remember his very first interview. Mm -hmm. And then it was a few weeks or even a month or two later when he went on the American news, he went public with his name and his face. So I wonder if that was in between those interviews. <laughs> that would make sense. Cool. Okay, so. Oh, it is Gosh. Marathon Man. I was right. Thank God. It is. Oh, okay. it, guys, check out the movie Marathon Man okay. from uh, 1976. There you go. You That's actually name it. Like I'm, I'm pretty good with movies. I've actually seen a ton of movies, but the ones you happen to name in this one, I haven't seen. But I've seen yeah. so many. But um, so yes. Bill Cooper, he all Bill Cooper also kind of went from extraterrestrials to demons. Yes. as well as many others. What do you yeah. think about that? I don't know. Um, one man's alien is another man's demon. I don't, I don't know how you, how you, I mean, there, because I grew up in a evangelical Christian home, uh, of, of course, you know, a, a big believer of, you know, light and the darkness, good and good and evil, um, demons and angels. I don't know. Possibly, possibly. I just don't know. I mean, there was, um, uh, what was that? What was that te wonderful television series came out a couple of years ago? Um, Childhood Childhood's End, where the aliens that showed up were red and scaly with with horns and a bifurcated tail. Yeah, right. And people immediately, it's like, holy, you know, can't trust these guys. But why? Well, because they they look like what? Thou demons are depicted. Well, in so this kind of goes back to Jacques Vallée too, because if it's a religious person, would an interdimensional entity? take the form of a demon or whatever yes it's pretty curious pretty curious yeah. or or the um the the 1561 nuremberg event because it was so early and there was no science fiction in 1561 the german people looked at it like it was a religious event that was the yeah. only way they could describe it. there was no other frame of reference for yeah. them so i mean could it be demons sure but at the same time demons have to come from somewhere i'd like to talk yeah. to one yeah. just to get the backstory <laughs> Okay, so Joe Rogan, real quick. Yeah. Okay, so I listened to part of your recent podcast, which, by the way, I, I take umbrage with your uh, chastising words against the Hoff, David Hasselhoff. When a guy is that <laughs> talented, we're not talking luck here. We're talking a once-in-a-lifetime talent. I mean, this guy's a phenomenal singer. I mean... This guy single-handedly brought down the Berlin Wall with his rendition of Looking for Freedom. All I know is that the wall was up before he sang, and then after he sang, it was down. And his acting talent is beyond anything that has since been seen, not to mention how prolific he is. Can you name another individual with more TV shows, movies, albums, live performances, radio shows, reality shows? I mean, this guy does it all. That the combination probably not. It's just that again, again, I'm not picking on David Hasselhoff. I, I actually I like him. I think he's fine, except for that drunken rant on the bathroom floor, which was unpleasant some years ago. Um, he he's he's fine. It's just that there is there are there are actors out there that just I've talked to it, just shake their heads like oh god, that lucky sob. You know, the again he didn't. I'm sure he did not know that. Like we won't even go into Night Rider. Right, that that Baywatch was going to be such a massive international success. Who could have possibly well, known? It actually, that... it actually wasn't. They got canceled first season. I don't know if you're familiar with the lore. They got hmm. canceled first season, 
and the half basically I th he either bought the rights to it a combination of buying the rights and producing it like he put his own money into it and got I the did rights not know that. after it got canceled because it was so bad i mean if you remember it was season terrible one, yeah season one was bad yeah. and they had that really distasteful episode that nobody talks about where there's a serial killer on the loose it was oh, wow. so distasteful because can you imagine like you know bright and sunny lifeguards and then they're making jokes about people getting murdered it was a really distasteful episode. Wow. Like that's my least You're favorite that, episode. That the reason it became so popular was because David Hasselhoff. <laughs> well, I I'm so gonna look up I, the lore on this. Yeah, it so for season two, he actually was more in control and he made it more about the lifeguarding because season one was all over the place. They even had a what was his name? Carrie Tagaya, like that uh martial arts actor, the guy yeah. that played Shang Tsung. Okay. In Mortal Kombat. He was oh, yeah. in an episode with a samurai sword fight with with the half. Oh, so you have lifeguards in samurai fights when, when his kid got kid, like season one is is bonkers. Like season oh. one was is some of the most insane television ever aired. And then season to... two is the Baywatch that everybody thinks of. Like season uh, two we're... onward is like normal lifeguard stuff. But Baywatch Nights was also kind of awesome, where it gets into the paranormal. And again. So Hasselhoff is filming feature films, recording albums, doing live shows while filming two shows simultaneously and producing them. There has All never right. been a talent like this before. I stand corrected. You know what? <laughs> I will give in, in future things. I will give David Hasselhoff more credit. <laughs> but I'm still not giving him credit for Knight Rider because that was not him. That was all. That and, and was that, not. You are correct about that. The that American was people, not him. Who would have? It happens every once in a while. You don't know the the first rule of media has never changed, which is give the people what they want. And most of them, they don't know what they want. Yeah. And in this case, it's like, oh yeah, it's just a Saturday morning stupid show about a talking car. It's like I love that show, by the way. Anyway, everybody did. <laughs> everybody did. It, 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 it's like prime time, just ratings through the freaking roof. Why? Because well, it was there was really nothing quite like it. It was just awesome. No. no. It's like it wasn't. It wasn't true. It was AI before it was. Yeah. Before AI was. I, I don't want to get into it. So okay. What else? Anyway, with Joe Rogan. Yeah. How is he not a show? Oh no no he is a show. He absolutely okay. absolutely is. But he is not. Is he privy to a lot of things? Um. Uh. No. No, I don't think he is. I mean, they they gave again. You know the story as much as anyone. You know he was he was one of the early truth guys. Yeah ironic that he played on news radio a conspiracy guy you know a conspiracy maintenance guy back in the 90s and then he um they you know they give him a, a show called joe rogan questions everything and in episode one he apologizes to nasa for every bad thing he ever said about them including you know there's no way we went to the moon and then they make him the the biggest podcast in in the world for a while i, I think he's number two now but whatever um and you know he has astronauts on and Neil deGrasse Tyson on and and all that stuff. Oh no 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 no! And and one of his mentors, one of the guys he really looks up to, is Alex Jones. Legitimately, I've seen those two in the same room together, and yeah. he just worships freaking Alex Jones, which is so weird. It's like it yeah, your career is way yeah. different than Alex Jones. Yeah. Um. But no, I I I think that Alex was, and Alex Jones even said so as much during his um uh divorce trial, where not only did Alex say that my you know that his character was in was a complete fabrication, you know that whole. Rah, 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 that yeah. whole thing, but that um that Joe was compromised. You know, that it's yeah. like you know they offered him the the two briefcases, yeah. and and Joe played. Well, he's ball. not he's not the only person to say that about Joe Rogan. So okay. one of the most interesting things about Joe Rogan, his pivot on the moon landing, right. the reason it was so obvious, was because he never said why. Like, what was the exact reason? where all of his previous arguments were suddenly invalidated. Like, where's the evidence? Like, what led him to change the position? That's what's so obvious. He never... Yeah, he yeah that was that was my my point that I threw at people. I go, if he's, leg you know, if he's sincere, he'd be the only man I've ever known that actually climbed out of the rabbit hole <laughs> entirely, turned around and said, oh, I didn't see anything. It's like, how? No, it, it's impossible. Right. You know, especially, you you know, full well, I mean, NASA, I, you can't attack NASA with that sort of enthusiasm and conviction. And he had it, which is why they got to him. Yeah. And then turn around and say, I was comply. I was completely wrong. 
Are you going to explain what, how, what you said, how, how, what reasonings behind this? Nope. I'm just going to, Hey, look, I've got an astronaut as a guest and just continue on from well, there. It's like, and the other thing too, regarding nine 11, the way he tiptoes around it out. Cause he had some heated debates in the past right. on nine 11 and the demolition. Sure. And now whenever it comes up, he, he doesn't jump to defend the official narrative. But it's very obvious how he tiptoes and doesn't want to really get into the conversation about it. Yeah, yeah, and then that's and that's a, a sign of somebody that's you know th in the back of their mind, it's like there could be consequences if yeah. I talk about this. Oh, really? Where are those consequences coming from? Yeah. Have you seen my episode, my Apollo missions episodes, where I have the electromagnetic frequency breakdown? I think so. I think so. I've watched Where a lot of your stuff. You can see, you can see that the the frequency is identical to artificial inter interior lighting. No, oh, from that's, the moon landing. But, and I've never, right. nobody's ever come up with a rebuttal for it. Sure. So nobody's even tried, which I thought was interesting. Most most of the time, they don't want to talk about anything. They they know full well any. I mean, I've talked to scientists, and you know, they they don't even want to address Apollo nowadays because it's it's aged so badly i mean hell one of the things i came up with um not too long ago at all was i go isn't it interesting that even though scuba divers are constantly constantly watching their their app their oxygen gauges right that's all they do yeah. the astronauts did not care it never came up meaning the the again especially with that car right you're driving miles in that direction that car breaks down you're gonna have to hoof it back. Yeah. You got the air, not even an issue. It's That's like a good point. What what That's magical thing in 1969 did you have unlimited air? No one talks about it, and that's that is a production technique. That is straight up Hollywood, which is yeah. There are certain things when you write scripts, which is we don't want to talk about it because it'll bog down the plot. Have you, have you seen my Matt Walsh breakdown on his defense of the moon landing? Uh, maybe why? Check. What was the so? I did the logical fallacy counter. He he's been setting records. He was setting records. Oh, I think I did say some of this, but and go ahead. I brought up I brought up a couple of things that I haven't seen people bring up. Like he was arguing that there were no whistleblowers. There was more than one deathbed confession, um, and more so, than one death. <laughs> yeah, where they, they actually named the exact. I don't remember the exact place. They named exactly where they shot it. Sure. I so the, now maybe they're lying, but obviously it's false to claim that there were no deathbed confessions because there were. Right. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then that kind of disappeared from the Internet pretty quickly. Yeah. Because I remember it was really big news for one day and then it got scrubbed. Pe people also say, you know, why? Why is no astronaut you know, come out and said something? It's like, well, first off, there's less than 600 people that even have claimed to have been in that position. And then everyone, again, if I was them, you'd psychologically profile every single one of these guys. And yeah. then you tap every form of communication they had. You'd monitor their phones, their emails, their spouse's phones, all their friends. And you would look for the telltale signs. If anyone even wavered in the slightest, you would have the briefcase conversation with them. It's like, remember what we talked about? Were, because were again, you on a... were you oh, on go Google forums back in the day? No, no, I wasn't. Wow, I was AOL forums, but not Google what, forums. What went on on Google? Um, again, there's no way to verify these were the actual astronauts or their families. Yeah, but this was in the '90s. Uh, I have. I probably shouldn't say this. I have some of them saved. They did discuss it. <laughs> really. Now, it was the way they dis – well, their family members said oh, that they discussed it. Got it. Got and it. they were saying they didn't really want to talk about it, but when they got drunk this one time. And it was – they're just interesting story. Maybe it's all made up, but I just thought it was interesting because you really can't control someone getting drunk. Like, out of their entire – and some of them were alcoholics, especially after the missions, not necessarily yes. before, yes. which is also Absolutely. curious. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, just uh, regarding Rogan – have you seen, I believe his name was Matthew North. There's, do you know who that is? Not by name, but go ahead. So Matthew North was this, um, I think I played a short clip. I forget which podcast. This kid did tons of research. Um, JR, who does the podcast with me sometimes, I have no idea in what capacity he works for the for the government. It might be a janitor for the Park Service. That's my joke. 
Okay. But he's he I think he's at least been around water coolers where he's heard things discussed be, because he he knows he knows the exact details of how the the state department pays other departments so they they don't even know where people work like he knew all these little details that nobody knows. Okay. So either way, he said that Matthew North reads exactly like a shill because this was some 19-year-old kid with this stratospheric IQ. Just the way you could listen to his to him talk. His videos are still on Rumble. I think they've been taken down on YouTube, but they're on Rumble. People re-uploaded them. So he's dead now. Nobody knows how he died. But he made a few videos. He made one big video. It was like two or three hours long where he exposed Alex Jones, Joe Rogan. He named their, their CIA handlers. He traced everywhere they lived and who they worked with and who their managers were. It was mm. really crazy. Now... Mm. And then all of a sudden his obituary pops up, but it doesn't say a cause of death. And he was 19? Uh, at the time of the video, I forget exact. He might have even been 17 when he first started making the videos. Mm. But they're, they're videos, so you can see him talking. Hmm. So it's it's because he's definitely some kind of super genius because the way he was able to just collate all of this information, like I can't do it. And I've been yeah. I've been studying stuff for decades. Yeah. So he he was like a super genius and huh. he he traced Alex Jones and Joe Rogan. He said they're, these are not organic individuals. It's it's possible. I, I use the um, I'm going to call it the, the goodwill hunting reference. And that is if you have a will hunting character that absolutely cannot be controlled. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like, oh, yeah, we have no chance. Yeah. This guy is uh, not necessarily an anarchist. But he would do like nothing better than to tear down part of the establishment. Uh, and I don't believe I haven't seen because I remember actually seeing his videos when they first popped up. Nobody even attempted a rebuttal because he sourced everything. He had all the receipts. Wow. Nobody even attempted a rebuttal. Hmm. It was just either people calling him crazy or hmm. people saying, wow, that's amazing that you won. Because this was years ago. I don't know that maybe 2017, maybe somewhere around there. Hmm. So this was at the, t this was probably be were people calling Alex Jones a shill back then, maybe, but not as pop, not as much, not as, as much as they are yeah. now. The, the big thing that, that got Alex was when he showed up with Piers Morgan on CNN and, okay. and Piers Morgan was taught interviewing him and see, it's like, and I'm, I raised an eyebrow. It's like, what are you doing on there? And why is he on there? You know, I, I'm is, actually. I actually don't know what to make of Alex Jones. If he was an MK Ultra personality, yeah. he definitely at least has one personality that is not aware that he's a shill. Very because, possible. Yeah, that's that's my theory on that. Because even his interview about the Piers Morgan interview, like how he was explaining everything backstage, yeah, that was not the same personality that was in the like if you if you watch him side by side, it's almost like it's a completely different person. It's weird. It's they really they could be they could be using subliminal nudging on yeah. on him just to, I mean you don't have to I mean again you want to keep his enthusiasm you know the yeah. the way it is you want to keep him as authentic as you can there's only so much you can do though because you know the the truther community is naturally suspicious so they're they're always going to squint at him and wonder what what I'm wondering you know how how if the if the massive divorce and and attack you know with the whole school thing we're not yeah. supposed to talk about if that yeah. if that hurt him or helped him i'm not sure because they made an example out of him i'm not but, sure either but at the same time it might have actually given him more credibility in our circles but whatever so you you know david weiss quite well yeah, yeah. what is his opinion of alex jones i'm going to talk to him too but i'm just wondering what 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 does he make of alex jones because he met him in person he did um he he I think David is is still again when you meet somebody in person it it's a little different uh yeah because because Alex was saying stuff behind the scenes that 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 he can't say anymore on air that he's still sticking to his story especially about school stuff and so wow yeah. are you are you are you okay with me sharing this oh that's fine that's fine what, what are they gonna okay. do it's it's hearsay of hearsay yeah. So it's, like wait, wait, there's not there's not much you can say, and of, and of course, I mean again that just because you make an example of them doesn't mean they're going to change their tune, right? Right. It's <laughs> not like he's going to walk it back like, wow, well, I was wrong with this, rah, rah, rah. you know, no, nothing like that. So um, no, I I think David's going to say, oh yeah, he's authentic. Now, 
to what capacity is he being kind of again nudged in certain directions without his knowledge very very possible sure i that's what you would do i mean he's one of the leading yeah. guys in that that demographic so why why wouldn't you um but do i do i think he's you know i i don't think he's joe rogan right let's put it that right, way right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Where, where joe knows what's going on i think yeah. alex is more like joe meg alex may have suspicions but what what can he do he's in a tough spot yeah. now now especially with the money now it's like you when you're sued for a billion dollars when an individual is sued for a billion dollars it was actually it was actually several trillion was the highest number you're kidding was it no. actually trillion dollars? at one That's... point at one point that was the requested amount hmm. i think it was uh, it was i think it was two or three point something trillion like higher than the gdp of certain countries hmm. That's what they wanted. Now that that's not the current number, but yeah. the, there's a, at least one article. There was one of the earlier ru uh, rulings. That's what they were going for. They were going for a trillion, not not billion. I mean, it's a dual purpose win for the establishment, which is not only do you send a huge flag saying, "Hey, there," you know, don't yeah. be like that guy, and at the same time, you can go to him. It's like, okay, you. Uh, you gonna be more pliable here? You know, you only have to meet with us like once every month. Well, I don't. I don't think he's paid a single dollar, right? I don't think so either. Yeah, no. I don't think he's actually paid any because he just declared bankruptcy. Yeah. Well, yeah, you had to. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, <laughs> I had to, but no, that was one of my. And I know we can't talk about it, but yeah, it was. In fact, I put a challenge out there for a number of years, um, where I said, and again, I'm be being delicate with the verbiage here, where I said, look, I'll pay pay PayPal anybody a thousand dollars if you can show me a ten second clip of an individual that's being taken out of that place in real time. The problem, yeah. the the why that operation was blown immediately is because the traffic helicopters got there so quickly, because again, yeah. they didn't have traffic to deal with, that it was over, right? It's like they're just hovering on a full tank of gas for a long time and nobody yeah. was coming out. For some reason, there seems to be, I don't know why, but there's like a timer on some of these events. For example, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to get shut down soon, but I have the longest running Columbine series on YouTube. And I actually went through all of the documents, the thousands of documents in Columbine. I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with the Columbine conspiracy. I, I was actually in Denver when it happened. No way. I was, I was, I was wow. living it. I was living. So you Denver. were watching it on the news as it unfolded? Believe it or not, I was, funny story, I was, I was on a business trip in Houston that day. I just flown from Denver to Houston, and I remember my boss calling me up because of my fireworks thing, and he calls me up in my hotel room, and he goes, he goes, I just want to know, because he, he and I were about the same age, and he goes, uh, he goes, did you have anything to do with this at all? You can tell me. Wow, and that's he, messed up. And he was, I know, and I said, that is so messed up. Why are you yeah. asking me this? He's going, look, look, we talked about your past. I want to know. I go, no, I didn't have anything to do with it. Then I made some funny comment about it. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So, no, I was, I'm very aware of the Columbine thing, but go ahead. My, in my latest episode, I actually, I actually played the dispatch audio. Oh, did and you? everybody knew that it was going to happen. Two agencies got the tip that it was going to happen. There's a national trench coat mafia. And there, there were so many agents. This is straight from one of the officers. Oh. And then the, the amount that's been covered up in Columbine is just astounding. It's absolutely yeah. astounding. And it, it looks like there were probably seven or eight shooters. Oh, wow. Well, and they were some supposed of, to. Yeah, go ahead. Some of them were identified as middle-aged men. Oh, wow. So not high school kids. The, so they the... might have had some handlers there. Very possible. Um. And the, the point I want to make there, the, the comparison, was that it took a long time for that to be resolved, right? You know, there, there were kids throwing themselves out of windows. There were a lot of injuries on top yeah. of the dust. And the point was, it took a long time. Do you know how long it would take to evacuate 600 elementary kids from a from, from a place? You'd have to go room to room. It would take for a freaking Well, I have forever. another question. Have yeah. you ever seen... Obviously, we're not talking about the event in Connecticut. We are not talking about that event. Yeah, okay. well, we're talking that. about elementary schools in other states. Have you ever seen one without any Christmas decorations on Christmas? Excellent point. In December? 
that That's one that kind of got me not to mention if you read ballistic again we're not talking about the event in connecticut but if you if you ask someone to believe about an event that happened outside of connecticut in other states or other countries would you believe that moving targets have a 100 percent accuracy rate from from a handgun we're talking like 11 oh, 12 13 shots oh no i'm a shooter i that was one of the first okay. things i jumped on yeah which was okay 150 rounds fired right and no wounded a but if by the way it's never happened in the history of mass shooting it's like a perfect kill ratio it doesn't happen so you're telling me that either every shot was absolutely lethal or it was complete miss and it's, yeah. Okay. It's stats. Somebody, somebody, give me the stats on this. It never ever happens. Ever. But how ever, do you ever. how do you have a hundred percent accuracy against a moving target? It, yeah, I mean, it's I know. anyway. Okay. So I let's. Know. So Joe Rogan, yep. very very curious individual. Some people think that he platformed Eddie Bravo. I did a whole seven hour breakdown of Eddie thrashing him logically on flat Earth and nuclear weapons too, but. The uh, some people think that Joe Rogan's more he's platforming flat earth to get it out there while pretending to be against it. What do you think about that theory? If he is, then even that is being directed by somebody else. I don't think he came up with it on his own. Uh, Probably again, not. The, the the mixed message during his comedy special I, it drove me insane, which yeah. is why I had to make that little video. Yeah, it's that like, was okay, weird. again, eight minutes, no moon landing, 34 minutes, looks flat. 59 minutes flat earthers are retarded where, where are you going where are you going with this who did you, I think, you must bet yeah it's almost like that was an intentional shot yeah like a wink wink type shot not yeah. like an organic joke yeah well no i mean routines like that especially stuff like that i mean you, you it is refined and refined and refined uh there was you know there's no accident there so um it could be it's very possible. He, I knew that in the past, and you've seen him do it, he brought up Flat Earth to many guests. Yeah. Many guests. Yeah, partly yeah. because it's good production value. You bring it up at like a shock value and see what they do. Right? It was actually you know. hilarious because I did a logical analysis when he had uh, Michael Shermer on, the alleged yeah. skeptic who's never skeptical about anything coming from the establishment. And yeah. they were so clueless. They thought the Sumer that all of the ancient civilizations, including the Sumerians, had a globe Earth cosmology. Like, Talk about clueless. Oof. Like they don't even have they couldn't even go on Wikipedia for two seconds. And obviously Jamie is not fact checking Shermer a single time. He would never fact check Shermer or Neil deGrasse. Like he would never fact check any of those guys. He'll only fact check Eddie Bravo. <laughs> right. Right. And not and, even and fact check correctly at that. Uh, but I will two... be... I'm sorry, what? go ahead. Uh, I just have two more questions. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. One of them is uh this controversial question. I actually don't know what they were talking about, but a lot of people in the chat on some of the Flat Earth podcasts on Mindshock were asking you why you didn't quit Flat Earth. That Was there some kind of a challenge? I don't know anything about that. Oh, my God. Okay. So the, some years ago, I said, again, through, I threw it out there for a number of years and where I said, Look, there, you're you're not going to find a curvature in any in any picture, you know, especially at, from an airline, you know, airplane photo, um, you know, an actual curvature. I go if you take a, I go the the routine was, you take a picture, then you take it home, you put it on your laptop or whatever, and you hold a straight edge up to it, right? If it's still curved, right, send me the picture. I'll quit flat Earth. And that went on for oh good lord four or five years at least. Nobody <laughs> sent me anything right because they couldn't right there's nothing yeah. to send right if it's a legitimate picture and then some photographer i can't i think he was from england took a couple shots the with clouds in the distance the clouds had a nice curve at the at the edges of them and he sent them off and then but then made a video of it sending it to me and calling me on the phone leaving a voicemail <laughs> and then his guys are like oh see see he should have quit flat earth and so it's been like a running joke for at least a year and a half now where it's like, okay. oh, it, Mark. The, the person in the chat made it sound like it was something, some kind of legit, like not a photo, some kind of like legit challenge of some kind. Oh, no, no, that's different. That's separate. That's the Antarctica challenge. No, me quitting, that's straight up. That That's just the photo thing, right? But they okay. could, but the, the Antarctica challenge, you look and I'm sure you're aware of the, the, the final experiment, yeah. the Jaren thing. 
that's what that's about, which is, oh, aren't you going to quit Flat Earth like Jaren's going to quit Flat Earth when he goes down to Antarctica with the trolls or whoever the, whoever's taking him down there and he sees the 24-hour sun. And nobody's going to quit Flat Earth. I mean, Jaren, Jaren I, don't, I don't think even Jaren's going to die on that hill. Um, for me, it's never been about that because I, I said, yes, I, I've said that literally since year one, which is the weakest aspect of Flat Earth just from a technical standpoint, it has to be the 24-hour sun because there can't be a 24-hour sun if there's just one light source, unless there's more than one light source, unless, but then I'm a big virtual guy. I'm a big matrixy guy and programmer, right? You know, software. So I was like, look, you want to, you want to make a 24-hour sun? It's not hard to do. We do it in stuff all the time. Um, but Jaren's putting a lot of weight behind it and so are the trolls. And Jaren, what I'm trying to remind people is, it doesn't give, even if you saw a 24-hour sun, it just say, like, fine, there's a 24-hour sun. That does not give it veto power over everything we've been covering for the last nine years. Not even close, especially when it comes to NASA and all the other stuff. Is it a plot hole in Flat Earth? Yeah, but I addressed it in well, the beginning. I actually, I actually wouldn't say it. So first of all, I am mm -hmm. not saying Flat Earth is true. But I whether know. it's true or not, right. the 24-hour sun in Antarctica wouldn't be a plot hole because according to the scientific method, you would have to verify the distances between continents relative to Antarctica first. There you go. To know the path of the sun. Uh, actually, I'm going to discuss this with uh, with Dave Weiss sure. uh, when I talk to him because he wanted to discuss it. Oh, he, he's he got actually, an opinion or two on it. What was that? <laughs> he's got an opinion or two on it. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's my issue with it because this it's like, all of these globe earthers, they're arguing without understanding what a begging the question logical fallacies. If they just understood that fallacy, mm -hmm. all flat earth debates would be 99% shorter because they spent all that time as if, because they, they presuppose the continents are exactly where they are said to be. Right. Like when you're dealing with, with science, you have to verify all of those distances because when you're standing in what's purported to be Antarctica, you you might not be where you think you are in relation to the other continents. And that's like, mm. that's a big thing. And for whatever reason, sure. it's really hard. Like 99% of the trolls in the mind shock chat on flat earth uh, podcasts are people who don't understand that basic concept. If they just understood that concept, it would be so much easier. So my mm. final question, which I think okay. you've gotten, you've gotten this before too. Mm -hmm. Where do you see all of this going? Because flat earth, has just skyrocketed in popularity over the right. past few years. There is no going back. There's just no going back because even the mere act of asking those questions against authorities and scientism, even just for the sake of argument, let's say flat earth, there's some kind of a damning evidence disproving flat earth. There's still no going back because of everything else that it touched in terms of authorities and scientism. Mm -hmm. So where do you see... Where do you see, like, what kind of world do you see in, let's say, another two, three, four, five years Yeah. because of everything that has happened with the light? The reason why I love Flat Earth Debate so much is just the logical aspect, because when you understand logic, you can apply it to anything, to any area of life. And Flat right. Earth is just, it's some of the best content in addressing not just logic, but psychology with cognitive dissonance and, and everything else. So where do you see the world because of this cat being let out of the bag? Where's this going in the next few years? Uh, for me, I mean, I'm, it's, it's been a wish of mine for some time, and I, I call it the, um, uh, the Tower of Babel protocol, which is, Avenger, if you know the Tower of Babel story, you know, one of the shortest <laughs> wonderful stories in Genesis, which is that the first civilization that was 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 here, not us, was too good at what they did. They they weren't divisive in any way. They were unified. They were they had engineer amazing engineering skills, and they fig figured out where we were almost immediately. And they figured out there was a ceiling to this place, and it's like, yeah, you know what? We can do it. Let's build a freaking structure, a big bridge to uh, to the top. And as soon as they started working on it, uh, whoever was responsible for this place, call it God or whatever you want, advanced civilization, interdimensional, whoever, looks down and says, uh, this isn't good. They're going to make it. So we got we to gotta do something here. So at that point, diversity was put into place, which was, you know, language, 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 scatter, 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 tear it down, and then, you know, kind of start over. Um, that's what I think happens with every civilization to a certain point, or maybe doesn't, uh, but that's what I believe in anyway, kind of like the 100th monkey effect, 
which is if enough people wake up to this, snap out of the matrix, uh, we'll use the matrix reference, even though the movie's 25 years old now. Um, if enough people snap out of it, enough people realize where they are, then whoever's responsible for this place chimes in and says, okay, well, it's time, you know, it's time to, to move on to whatever the next phase. If you want to call it a reset, that's fine. Um, but I call it kind of like a graduated class, you know, every, every high school, when you graduate from high school, right. You don't get to, you don't get to stay there anymore. You, you get off somewhere. We got a new class coming in. You don't have to go home, but you gotta get the hell out of here. And that's, that's how it works. I think every civilization has their time. We've had unbroken history. We'll just round down to like 5,000 years, give or take, you know, unbroken history. Um, once we, once we have our time here, then we have our chance to move on to, to do something else. And that's what I'm kind of hoping for a bigger, better world. Um, where we go, I, I don't know, but, uh, it's gotta be more interesting than, than what we're, what we're doing now. So that's, you know, flat earth for me has always been a message of hope, which is you're not, again, you're not alone in, you know, this, this empty universe. And uh, if that if that brings about a massive change that's outside of our scope, outside of our civilization, I'm I'm all for it. So that's that's what I'm hoping for. Um, it's not it's not just enough for me to have people woken up, you know, what start a big revolution to to take over governments. You know that works out. It's just going to be another government moves in that tries to align itself more with a with the general population. So does that kind of help? Kind of. Yeah, it's just it's kind of hard to imagine that kind of shift can happen smoothly so to speak I, it, oh i didn't say it'd be smooth <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that's that's what what probably w would be the outcome which is any whoever's responsible for this place call it the superintendent whoever it's just a bigger bigger version than us again the the the, the things that were there during the nuremberg event in 1561 um whoever the caretakers are i think they're watching it very closely and if if you figure out again if it's if if all of a sudden this place isn't a nature preserve anymore where we're just where we don't realize once you realize the the structure the actual nature of the world then it's different right it's it's say, sorry on a quick tangent it's the same logic of why you know this one why the um the astronauts wouldn't put their hand on the bible right yeah. you know for, for bart sabrell <laughs> which is like look people people lie under oath all the time it's called yeah. perjury and we have tons yeah. of laws for it so why were the why were the astronauts treating the bible like it was radioactive or you know that was made out of molten lead yeah i think it's because it's different when you know meaning it's one thing if you believe in a create you know believe in a creator right or, or a higher power it's another thing to know there's a higher power when you believe you're willing to take chances because, well, you know, it's a belief, right? But if you know, then you're looking up at the sky and you're seeing someone, you know, looking over the top of a, of a newspaper, you know, from the couch looking at you and, and there is, so oh, you're not going to do what I think you're going to do. It's like, no, I mean, it's the same reason I will never do anything malicious to anyone else ever in my life, gun to my head, because I'm not going to take those, take, take the, that chance ever ever again i'm i'm all about not necessarily peace and love but i'm not going to go out of my way to pick on someone just for my own pleasure so yeah i'm gonna round this out with a compliment for you mark hmm. i think i'm not sure how much flat earth mind shock would even cover if it weren't for some of your interviews on like mainstream segments because oh. those are some of the first ones i saw Mm -hmm. And I made the logical analysis uh, videos on them, and they're so hilarious because everybody's expecting you to be this kind of bumbling idiot, and then you show up and you completely demolish like these NASA physicists and every. It's just so funny because you're kind of an unassuming guy. You look at this unassuming nice guy, yeah. but you're not just gonna take. You're not just gonna take it. You're there to give your information. And you yeah. do it in a nice way, like other people aren't as nice about it, but it's still absolutely hilarious. And I was just thinking, I have nice. to make videos on this to point out, like, this is such a great topic to point out these logical fallacies. So all of the Flat Earth fans on Mindshock, even the ones that are, you know, think you're a shill or whatever, they do have you to thank for, for a lot of the Mindshock coverage. So thanks well, again for that. I know. Thank you. And yeah, kill them with kindness. We can't all be Nathan Oakley. Um, <laughs> just brutalizes people. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've always been unassuming that way. And I, I, you're right. I kind of sneak up on you, uh, <laughs>
where they, they again, they assume it's like, oh, no, I can sleepwalk through this and just crush them. Yeah. It's like, really? Can you? Because <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think it's going to be so easy. But I, I do love disarming people. That is one of my favorite things. And uh, I, I'll tell you one quick story before I go, which is um, one of my I, I don't get intimidated much by uh, by interviews. But Piers Morgan, when he had an astronaut sitting right next to him on stage, that was one of my more intimidating things. And and they blindsided me with that. It's like they didn't tell me till right then. It's like, oh, by the way, you're going to have an astronaut sitting next to uh, <laughs> to to Piers. And and I've heard Piers before and Piers can be a real ass sometimes. Yeah. And he, I've heard him just harsh people to death. And after the first couple minutes, he couldn't have been nicer to me. To where, you know, at the end, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you be you and blah, blah, blah. But he, he was not condescending really that might mean i tried to start a fight between terry and i but that was natural so I yeah have a theory, I, that... I have a theory about him that he's just living his life as one giant illuminati humiliation ritual just because <laughs> like be. all these interviews he's getting absolutely smoked and i mean I, maybe there's a couple where he makes good points but a lot of the ones i've seen like even the andrew tate ones like some of them he's getting annihilated like, like it's like he has the lot the mental capacity of a small child and he's getting thrashed and he just keeps going. Like it's, it's kind of hilarious. Yeah. And he also puts on a new pair of socks every show. Yeah. Just so you know. I, I watched him in the background and it's like, what's he doing? Like brand new, you know, oh, the rapper, the new pair of socks. Everyone's got their I think thing. yeah, I think there's a lot of media personalities kind of like that where I, I mean I'm not joking. I actually think it's some kind of humiliation, just the stuff that they make them do. Like, Good how man. could you look that stupid? Even you're getting paid a lot of money. Yeah, sure. But yeah. but where's your dignity? Like, it's just kind of weird. Yeah. It's and and, weird. and by the way, I love, thank you for bringing up Andrew Day, because I, I love that he made that little clip where, you know, he said all the flattered stuff, you know, on camera. I don't know if you ever saw that yeah, clip. Yeah, yeah, I saw that one. It's awesome. It's great. So <laughs> more every day. Anything else yeah. I can do for you? Okay, awesome. No, this was a great talk. I think the Mind Shock listeners will be very happy with this one because we touched okay. upon... I mean, that's what I do. I, I I go comprehensive and exhaustive on so many things. And a lot of people thought you wouldn't have answered a lot of the questions that I asked you, oh, no. which well. that was one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, because I was like, for some reason, I think Mark's going to answer all. I think he's going to disappoint a lot of these people who think that he's going to just like have a meltdown moment or run away and terminate the interview. No. So I was looking forward to to asking you some of these questions that other personalities would have probably had a problem answering you want me to do like a greta response like how dare you <laughs> all right well we definitely got to do this again sometime yeah um, yeah you just let me know i'm more yeah, than more awesome. than happy thanks. i, yeah, I had fun so and much. thank you for the unique experience of talking to an animated bear that is yeah. actually me so don't tell anybody what i, look I won't like. i won't <laughs> tell anyone that you are a polar bear i believe interdimensional entity with a very interesting facial features but Boy, um yeah the uh and so i do have permission to post this entire do, interview in you entirety. have my permission to use anything that i do for anything you want okay thanks so much all right all right take care mark thank you have a good one you too bye bye